يا ربي لك الحمد حتى ترضى ولك الحمد إذا ما رضيت ولك الحمد بعد الرضاء ولك الحمد أبدا 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 والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبهم ويحبونه أذلة على المؤمنين أعزة على الكافرين يجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لومة لائم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله واسع عليم اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين I first of all ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he gives me the strength and clarity to deliver uh, a message that is uh, beneficial and is something that remains in the hearts and minds of myself included of the Muslims because the subject that I've, chose, uh, that I've chosen to share with you today is of really paramount importance and typically what I like to do in a khutbah is to focus on some portion of Allah's words and the portion that I've selected for you today is the 54th ayah of Surah An-Nisa. Surah An-Nisa happens to be a surah that's early Madani by most accounts and includes in it many instructions for Muslims on how to set up themselves as a community. So some of these are some of the foundational principles for a Muslim community to be established in Medina, in the life of Medina. And in it also it has principles for us of how to go beyond a community and really truly become a nation. So you know there's this idea of us, the smallest unit of humanity being an individual and beyond that being a family and beyond that being a neighborhood and beyond that being a community and even beyond that being a nation. And so it's these stepping stones that lead us to becoming a solidified nation, an ummah. And Allah Azza wa mentions these ayat and these injunctions one after the other in this surah, some of them having to do with divorce law, others having to do with fighting in the path of Allah, spending in the path of Allah. And you find a very interesting contrast. You find Allah Azza wa Jal talking to two groups of people. One group of people that's refusing to accept Islam. And another group of people who have accepted Islam on the outside, but have walked away on, the, on Islam from the inside, the munafiqoon. And there are different kinds of hypocrites. There are those who never really believed to begin with, and it was a facade to begin with. وَقَدْ دَخَلُوا بِالْكُفْرِ وَهُمْ قَدْ خَرَجُوا بِهِ right? they, just, they never had it to begin with. On the other hand, there are those who may have come with good will. They actually thought Islam had something good to offer. And they accepted it, thinking that it is the truth, it's convincing, and it's a beautiful thing. But when it came to its instructions and its injunctions, and its demands, they said, I love Islam, but this is getting a little too much. This is a lot to ask of a person. They were not like a lot of these people that came into Islam, a good number of them were not like the Sahaba of Mecca. You know, when you come into Islam in Mecca, it's not a bed of roses to begin with. They already know, if I become a Muslim now, well, all the Muslims I know are being cursed at, tortured, beaten up, made fun of. They're getting kicked out from their families' homes. So if I join these people, then I guess that's coming in my future too. There's no added advantages in becoming Muslim in the worldly sense. Not in Mecca anyway. When the Prophet ﷺ migrates to Medina, the Muslims are, to begin with, a strong community, significantly stronger than they were in Mecca. 
And now if you become a Muslim, it, the challenges are not the same as the challenges that were in Mecca. That which become a Muslim in Medina, that is. They're not the same. And so a lot of times people would jump into Islam not realizing the consequences. What are they getting themselves into? This deen is not an easy thing. It's not something that you, should, you can take casually. It really is a change of course for your entire life. So Allah Azza wa Jal in these ayat talks specifically, there's an entire passage dedicated to a discussion for the munafiqoon, for the hypocrites. And the hypocrites would walk away from Islam in two ways. And this is important. One is obviously leaving Islam altogether, ridda. Outright you become Muslim and everybody knows you're no longer Muslim. You become a kafir again. But there's another form of turning away from deen. And that is that on the outside you say that you still profess to be from the Muslims because that has social consequences if you walk away from Islam outright. And that has social consequences but for all practical purposes. And on the inside, there's nothing left. There's really nothing left. And when especially, now you've become a person of picking and choosing what do you take from the deen and what you don't take from the deen. And this is one of the central messages of this surah. That you don't have, you're not in a position to negotiate what it is from this deen that you accept and what it is from this deen that you don't accept. Or that you don't find comfortable so you're not, you know, you're not going to necessarily take it. This is one of the central ideas communicated in this deen. Just recently, actually yesterday over the internet, I was talking to a youth group in D.C. And, you know, a question came up in the discussion. There was this, you know, young sister who asked the question, I love everything about Islam except hijab. And it seems like hijab is there to protect men from looking at us. So, you know, I don't really see the point in it. And instead of arguing of the social benefits of hijab or what hijab does to honor women and all of that stuff, that's actually already going in the wrong direction, that conversation. We need to take a step back and ask a more fundamental question. Let's take a step back and let's, let's ask Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam loves Islam too. But then Allah makes a little tiny little request. How about you go in the middle of the desert and leave your family there? Right? He's not one that's gonna say, I love everything about Islam, but this whole leaving my family in the middle to die thing, I don't know. I'm not that comfortable with that. And after he's done with that, you know what, why don't you jump into a fire? You know, I love everything about Islam, except this whole you know, burning myself alive, that's asking a little too much. Nope, you don't find that question. Then Allah says, put a knife to your son's throat. Go ahead. And he says, you know, I love Islam, but I also love my son. I don't know, is there, can you give me a logical explanation for why I should do this? Can you tell me the social benefits or some of the other reasons, other benefits that why I should be obeying you? If قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلِمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ There's a reason Allah taught us that lesson in Surah Al-Baqarah. Whenever Allah said to him, give yourself up, submit, surrender, he said, I surrender, I give myself up, I submit myself entirely before the master of all peoples. So before we talk about any aspect of deen and try to figure out the logic of it, understand the larger purpose. Allah has made this deen one of submitting to him. If you're having a hard time submitting to him, you're having a hard time with Islam itself. The very central idea of deen itself. It's not to say you shouldn't understand the ahkam of Allah, but you have to, you and I have to be ones that once we understand them, we have to, whether we get it or not, whether we see the logic of it or not, we have to give it up. We have to just give it up. You know, Allah Azza wa even acknowledged in, in Surah Al-Baqarah when it came to riba. He said, well, you know, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَى It's a very interesting discussion. Allah Azza wa says there are people who consume riba. And they say that, you know, that's because they say that business is just like riba. I mean, if you look at liquid transactions, as solid transactions, and money, and cash, and what it's backed by, and it's a complicated discussion, it could go either way. You can't even tell the difference, 1920, potato, potato, one, two lines in a contract. I mean, what's the big deal? It is the same, and if you sit and have a four-hour argument with a finance major about whether riba is halal or not, you know, or what's the difference between riba and business, you might say, yeah, it's the same, yeah. I don't see the practical difference. But Allah then made only one line, instead of explaining to you the, the fine line differences between them, He said, there's only one more thing you need to know. Now that you understand to you in your head they're very similar, there's only one more thing. وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَا End of story. Allah made, uh, you know, Allah made business halal and He made riba haram. That is it. That's the conclusion. Now with that background in mind, I want you to inshallah ta'ala reflect upon the words of this profound ayah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Of course the ayah is addressing us. مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَن دينه. The one who turns back away, turns away among you, minkum, from his deen. The one who turns back from among you, from his deen. 
Allah didn't say all of us are turning back to, from, from our deen, a group from among us. And man is an interesting word in Arabic, it could refer to something plural, and it can also refer to something singular. So in a, from a point of view of taqlil, it could be even if a single person is walking away from deen, they're walking away from the religion. And I've already mentioned to you, this can happen in two ways. One, practically they denounce Islam altogether. And two, for all practical purposes, internally, in their heart, in their heart of hearts, in their thoughts, they really don't submit to Allah. They don't really see the point of living by Allah's teachings. They don't see the point in that anymore. So they, for, that, for those practical purposes, they've walked away from deen also, even if nobody else, human beings don't see it. We see a Muslim on the outside, we're supposed to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We're not supposed to judge what's in their heart, but Allah can. Allah sees what's inside. So whoever of you has walked away, or does so, then what does Allah say? Fasofa, then soon. And sofa is an, uh, the, the Arabic word that in, implies very soon. Allah, it, it won't take very long for Allah to take immediate steps. And what are those steps? Ya'ti Allahu biqawmin. Allah will bring about a nation. Allah will bring about, Allah will bring forward a nation. It's very interesting. The first part was, even if one of you walks away, and then Allah says, Allah will bring a whole nation around. In other words, you start thinking you're special? You think Allah needs you? You think you're a contributor to Islam that nobody else can be? That you are irreplaceable? Allah Azza wa Jal essentially says, what, what to speak of you, I'll bring a nation instead of you. You're, you're not an asset. You're not, don't think of yourself as that, that high. Already we're being put in our place. And one of the central embedded teachings of this ayah is humility. That we understand our place. That in this deen, when we get the honor of saying La ilaha illallah, when we have the honor of saying Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then this is an honor and a gift given by Allah. And if you don't appreciate this gift, then who needs you? There's plenty of others that can appreciate it more than you and I. There's plenty of others. Similarly, we have to start, stop thinking even those among us who are involved in religious activity. They're involved in positions of leadership, of volunteering, of helping out Islamic causes, whatever they're doing, in whatever capacity. Sometimes you start thinking, man, if I don't do it, it won't get done. If I'm not the one giving the khutbah, if I'm not the one helping out volunteering at the masjid, if I'm not on the board, if I'm not the MSA president, if I'm not running the da'wah organization, man, this work cannot happen. I can't even believe, you know, how I, I'm surprised it was even happening before I got here because I'm God's gift to Islamic work, right? So I, you know, without me, how would it even move forward? And Allah Azza wa Jal is letting us know, all of us know, that you know His deen is beyond you and I. And it's not like other people will come forward and so we give other people credit. Allah says, يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ Not يَأْتِ قَوْمٌ يَأْتِ قَوْمٌ would be a nation will come. يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ Allah will bring a nation. It's not even that new nation gets credit. Allah gets credit from bringing them out. Allah gets credit for the replacements. We are replaceable. And we are in a position of privilege and honor. And we have to accept that and admit that. And that's a humbling thing. At the same time it's an honor. At the same time you and I should be humbled. That Allah has chosen us and given us this responsibility, we should take it very, very seriously. And in no aspect of our deen, and in no ounce of our attitude, should we be people that turn back from our deen. In any capacity, altogether or partly. We shouldn't be of those people. We should be of the people who move forward. You know, there are interesting uh, 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 expressions in the Qur'an for Muslims moving forward. And essentially, if you're not moving forward, it's not that you're in your place, you're actually headed backwards. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu. مَا لَكُمْ إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ انْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِثَاقَلْتُمْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ رَضِيتُمْ بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ Surah Tawbah has very harsh language. What's wrong with you, those, who, those of you who claim to have iman? When you're told, march forward in Allah's path, your feet get planted into the earth. What is it? You prefer dunya over akhirah? Is that what's happened to you? It's understandable that a disbeliever who has no concept of paradise, who has no concept of hellfire, who has no concept of judgment day, if he prefers this world, it's logical, I understand. You're Muslims. You've been given far more better information. You know a lot more about what's ahead. And if you still prefer this world, there's some serious problem. Malakum is rightfully said. What would be wrong with you? What is wrong with you? That you don't march forward in Allah's path. Anyhow, so فَيَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ then Allah gives us qualities of this nation. And it's important to understand the comprehensive message of this ayah. In that Allah says there are people who may walk away from this deen, and now Allah is describing people who don't walk away from his deen. People who live up to the teachings of his deen. People that he expects a nation to be like. So when he gives us qualities of these replacements, 
really we should have these qualities so we're not replaced. That's the point of giving us these qualities. Is that we should aspire to carry these qualities in ourselves as an ummah. And may Allah make it easy for all of us to carry these qualities in ourselves. Allah says, يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ He loves them and they love Him back. He loves them and they love Him. Allah mentioned His love first. And one of the, one of the embedded teachings in that is He already loves us. He already loves us. And we sh when we appreciate that, we should truly love him back. He has given us an honor. You know, when you, a lot of times young people especially, as they're raised sometimes, unfortunately, in this country, you know, by Muslim families, our families, we fail to teach our children what an amazing thing it is to be a Muslim. We just raise them on, on cruise control, thinking we're raised Muslim, so our kids are going to be automatically appreciating Islam without us any, having to put any extra effort in it. Okay, maybe we'll drag them to Jum'ah prayer halfway through the salah, or we'll bring them to Sunday school and leave them outside and whatever, and then they do what they do for hours, and automatically somehow they will become righteous. And reality hits you when they become teenagers. And then you come running to the imam and say, can you talk to, talk to my boy or my girl? Because uh, they seem a little different now. It's ever since they got a license, I don't know what's happened to them. You know? Or ever since I, they got their cell phone, or I'm worried about who their friends are because they don't talk to me anymore. That stuff starts happening. But from the very beginning, we're supposed to be instilling certain values into our kids. So into our upcoming, the next generation. And one of those values is that this deen is actually a gift, not a prison, not a curse. A lot of times our young people, when you ask them, what do you think of Islam? What do you know about deen? They'll make a whole list of things that are haram. This is haram, that's haram, smiling is haram, happiness, joy, you know, taking a breath, relaxation, you know, having good friends, company. Here's a whole list of things that I shouldn't be doing. That's what it seems like Islam is. You ask him, what do you know about Allah? Well, Allah will take revenge and destroy the kuffar, and he, will, he has destroyed nations before, and he'll, he'll create, he's created hellfire on judgment day, he's going to humiliate people, and etc. They don't know, the first thing that comes to their mouth is not mercy. It's, it's not mercy, it's not guidance, it's not help. First thing that comes to their mind is judgment, punishment. Here's what I can't do, I can't live my life freely. That's what they think. But you know what the reality is? All other people are slaves. We're the only ones that are free. We're the only ones that are free. Everybody else is either a slave to their nafs, or they're a slave to their entertainment, or they're a slave to their bank account, or they're a slave to their job, or their career, or their appearance, or their fashion sense, or their car, or their house, or their payments. And we are slaves to Allah, freeing us from all of these things. It frees us from all of them. We're the only ones that are free. You walk around in a, this is supposed to be, our country is supposed to be an expression of individual freedom. You ever been to a high school? You see a bunch of cliques, they all dress the same. All the goth kids dress the same, all the hip hop kids dress the same, all these other groups of kids, they all dress the same. It's like they're enslaved into dressing a certain way. They have a uniform. This is supposed to be an individual country, right? <laughs> this is supposed to be individual. Everybody has to listen to the same song and watch the same movie and then report back to their friends and say, I saw it too. You know? This is individualism? This is what you call individualism? SubhanAllah. Allah has given us that, that honor that we don't have to follow a crowd. We don't have to turn into sheep. We don't. He has freed us from that by making us slaves of His. Coming back to the ayah. يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ Now the next part is really hard. And really that, I wanted that to be the heart of my khutbah. What really I wanted to share with you. Allah Azza wa Jal says the next quality. And some argue that this quality is a result of the first quality. Meaning if they really love Allah, if Allah loves them and they really love Allah, then the next part is natural. And that is adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen. And a lot of times we skip adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen and we go straight to a'izzatin ala al-kafirin, because that's easier. You know? Adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen. They are powerless, weak, humble, meek, soft in their dealings with believers. They are easygoing with believers. They're forgiving with believers. They're courteous in their language. They're not judgmental. They're not harsh with other Muslims. One of the worst qualities of a community that claims to be a believing community is that they are judgmental and harsh and backstabbing towards each other. This is one of the worst qualities Bani Israel had developed. So when Allah reminded them of the fundamentals of their deen, He included in those fundamentals, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا Speak to people nicely. Speak to people nicely. You'll find nowadays, unfortunately, a stigma associated with Muslims. The more religious they get, the more constipated they get socially the more difficult it is to talk to them, the angrier they look. If the guy's got a beard, it means he's just gonna constantly going to be upset at something. And you're going to avoid trying to talk to him. If a woman starts wearing hijab, it just means she's going to judge you because you're not wearing one, and she will look at you with eyes that will burn right through your hair. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the perception. 
But the closer you come to deen, that, that much more you're supposed to become courteous and kind and generous and understanding and forgiving of others. That's what you're supposed to be. Instead of looking at someone who's living in ignorance, a lot of Muslims do ignorant things nowadays. Maybe your friends do, and you don't do them anymore. But if your friends are doing ignorant things, your first thought is, Astaghfirullah, these people, I can't believe they're my friends. Such ignorance they do. They do bid'ah, they do kufr, they do shirk, they do haram, they don't care about anything. You were that guy two years ago. That was you. Who guided you? You guided yourself? وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا the same ayah which says, فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ He put love between your hearts is the same ayah as it says, you were at the very edge of hell. You were at the edge of the ditch. And He rescued you. So when somebody else is at the edge of the ditch, instead of getting angry at them and kicking them off, be patient, be courteous. Be patient. And sometimes you come and ask the imam and the scholar, you know, I'm trying to give da'wah to my brother or to my friend. It's been like two months. Nothing's happening. What should I do? Give me some magical thing to say. Tell me what I can do. You know what? What's Nuh alayhi salam's magic trick? It's sabr. He's talking to his own son for a very long time. His own, the same community for a very long time. And it's not like he talks to a group of people and they don't listen. He says, you know what? I'm packing my bags. I'm going somewhere else. Maybe I'll find a better crowd elsewhere. Nope. Same crowd. Same crowd. We have to be patient with each other, especially believers. Especially believers. And that's Nuh alayhi salam with kuffar. That's him with kuffar. That's the messenger for a decade, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, with the Quraysh of Makkah, the worst of the worst, for a decade. We're talking about Muslim families. We're talking about your own friends and neighbors. You know? We have to humble ourselves before them. It's a very serious problem, arrogance. You know, one of the great central teachings of our religion, La ilaha illallah, the beginnings, the beginning of our religion, is acknowledging the greatness of Allah. And the more you realize Allah's greatness, the, the natural result of that should be, the more you realize your own lesser status. The more you make Allah, declare Allah's greatness, the more humble you should become. That's the natural result of declaring La ilaha illallah. Every time you and I say Allahu Akbar, it is not just a statement of Allah's greatness, it's a statement of our own weakness. It's a statement of our own humility. But when people who say Allahu Akbar, then pass judgment of anybody who walks into the masjid, and they look at the size of their beard, or they look at how they're dressed, or they look at the accent of their language. You know, when that happens, when people who even work in Islamic causes look at each other with suspicious eyes, when they can't trust each other, you know, when people say salam without meaning salam, assalamu alaikum, you know, all of you know what that means. But what it implies is there's no beef between us, I don't dislike you, I love you, there's absolute peace and harmony between us. But when you say, Assalamu alaikum brother, you know, you don't mean it, you mean the exact opposite, I hate your guts brother, but you're saying Assalamu alaikum, that's what you're saying, and this is absolute hypocrisy. You cannot say Assalamu alaikum to someone and have feelings against them, you can't. Then you're saying something you don't mean. That's what, that's what you're doing. So you and I, we have to, you know, internalize adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen first. Humbled before the believers. A'izzatin ala al-kafirin. And they are tough, harsh, authoritative against kafirin. And kafirin here is not non-Muslims. Kafirin is here enemies of Islam. Kafirin is here who are trying to undermine Islam. The Muslims were not harsh with all non-Muslims in Medina. Who were they harsh with? The enemies of Islam. Those who were trying to undermine Islam, attack Islam, insult the religion, say things against the Prophet, say things against the Qur'an. Those who were trying to attack Medina from, from, from Mecca. Those people, they have to be harsh towards them. They're not going to back off. They're not going to take it sitting. They stand up for themselves. So what we're learning here is a fine line between we're not arrogant because we're humble. At the same time, it's not like you can walk all over us either. We stand up for ourselves. We don't take it sitting down. Our, our, you know, our young men, the, a lot of you, they go to public school, young men and you know, our girls, they go to public school and people pass comments at them. Stand up for yourself. Stand up for yourself. Don't take it just, oh, I have to be patient and you know, I have to be humble and you're walking like, you know, you've got a back surgery or something, your back is lowered and, and you think this is like Islamic, that you have to you know, look like you're, you're, you're weak or you're sick or something. No. Uh, we have to lower our gaze, that's fine. But that doesn't mean we have to lower our heads. It doesn't mean that. We have to be confident people. We have to instill confidence in our deen so much, so much, that when we see kufr, we, we look at its inferiority. We see how inferior and pathetic it is. And we see the pride and the greatness that Allah has given us in Islam. 
We're not arrogant, but we certainly are confident. That's what we have to be. أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ And then Allah goes further to say, لَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمَةَ لَائِمٍ They're not afraid of the blame of any blamer. In other words, people will say things to us. People will accuse of us of things. People will accuse, literally لَوْمْ Accuse. People will accuse us of things. The Peter kings of the world will accuse us of things before Congress. They will do so. But we won't be afraid of it. We're not gonna go, do you know what he said about Muslims? Oh my God, what's gonna happen now? No, 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 no. We, were, we, were, we knew what was gonna happen. We knew what was gonna come. And we're not afraid of it. We don't have to explain ourselves to you. We don't, you don't have to tell us you guys are crazy, this, that, or the other. And we have to exhaust our breath telling you, no, 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 we're not crazy, we're normal, we're okay. No, no, that's what they want. They wanna keep us busy constantly telling them that we're not crazy. That we're not, Islam, Muslims are not violent, Muslims are not extremists, Muslims are not this, Muslims are not that. They want us to make a whole list of things that Muslims are not. So we never get to tell them what Muslims are. Right, that's the point. You know, we're, you're constantly busy explaining yourself. لا يخافون في الله لوم تلائمين لا يخافون في الله لوم تلائمين And then finally Allah says, يجاهدون في سبيل الله Allah Azza wa Jal argues, يجاهدون في سبيل الله They struggle as hard as they can in Allah's path. In other words, this ummah has come together because that this ummah is on a journey. It's on a journey, it has a goal. And it's got to get to that goal. And they have to take care of the business inside the house before they can reach that, they can deal with the higher goal. You have to have your house in order to do bigger and better things. The, our, Allah has made us an ummah for a very high cause. It's called al-jihad fi sabilillah. We're not afraid of that term. It's a noble term in the Quran. And it has nothing to do with the craziness associated with it. We have to confidently study this term and understand what it refers to. It refers to the mission of all messengers. All messengers were doing jihad fi sabilillah. Isa alayhi salam did jihad fi sabilillah. Musa alayhi salam did jihad fi sabilillah. Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam did jihad fi sabilillah. They struggled in Allah's path. Allah gave them a mission and they struggled in it. This ummah has a mission. It has a goal to accomplish. It has to clarify the teachings of this deen to the rest of the world. It has to show the world the beauty of Islam. That's a big goal. It's not a small goal. You know, with all the billions of dollars being pushed into demonizing Muslims, this ummah has a goal to overcome all of that because they may have finances on their side, but Allah Azza wa Jal is on our side. You know, Allah is on our side. So we have a goal, we have a mission. But we cannot accomplish this mission if we're bickering among each other and arguing among ourselves. And we're too busy dealing with you know, these pathetic things that are holding us back from what really Allah created us for. يُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And then Allah Azza wa Jal ends, ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ That is the favor of Allah. That is the favor of Allah. If you and I become an ummah that truly struggles for the sake of Allah, that show humility to each other, that become tough against the enemy, we become stern and we don't take it lying down. We become these people. Then Allah is saying, that is Allah's favor. Now these people are standing up for themselves. Now they're doing what I commanded them to do. Now they're moving forward. We're constantly thinking in our communities, we're never gonna be, oh alhamdulillah, we've accomplished everything we need to as a community. We're always thinking, what more we need to do? What's the next step? It's a sabil, it's a path. What's the next step in this path? What's the next milestone? What more do we need to get done? We're constantly thinking ahead. What more do we need to do? And what we need to instill into our kids, we, go, we only got this far, you guys gotta go further. This is just the beginning. These are the people Allah Azza wa Jalla says, this is the favor of Allah. This is the blessing of Allah. يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives it to whoever he wants. And he's given it right now to us. He's given it to us. And it's not, Allah didn't say that he's given it to us and we can hold on to it. If we walk away from these responsibilities, we are replaceable. SubhanAllah. يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ and Allah is, oh, wallahu wasi'un alim asif. Allah is vast and all knowledgeable. He knows what we're saying on our tongues and He knows what we mean inside our hearts. He knows what we represent, whether we are people that will move forward or people that won't move forward. Just because you've been hired for a job doesn't mean you'll do it. Just because we're Muslim doesn't mean we're going to get the job done. We have to all get serious. We have to all, all rewire our thinking as individuals, as families, and as communities. Be a part of the masjid. Bring your family to the masjid. Listen to the lectures that are, that are being offered every week. Bring your, you know, bring your uh, kids to the khutbah. Let them hear a message every week. This is an important part of them developing their thinking. If you don't associate them, these, these are the only safe havens left for us learning our deen. Don't rely on a computer. Because the computer comes with many good things and also comes with a lot of garbage. You know, 
If Allah has given us the blessing to be able to establish His houses all across this country, including this great masjid here, you have to answer Allah for not appreciating it. You have to answer Allah for not breaking it at least some part of your child's life. You guys are going to grow older, your kids are 7, 8, 10, 12 years old now, when they're 50 and 60, maybe they'll even abandon Salat, and one day the thought will come in their mind, you know what, my dad used to take me to the masjid, I should go back. I've met people like that, that left Salat, left Deen altogether, and then when the age of 60, he comes back to the masjid. We were just talking, like, why'd you come back? Because he goes, I remember my dad used to take me here, so something in my heart said I should do that again. And he came back. We want to instill these memories into our children's lives. Do that. Be, take that responsibility. Start with these first steps. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who love Him and He loves us. May Allah make us of those who are not afraid of the blame of anyone who blames us. May Allah make us of those who truly do struggle in His path. And may Allah make all of our efforts in this deen, however many shortcomings they've had. May Allah accept all of our efforts and overlook those shortcomings. And may Allah accept our sincere repentance before Him. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi Quran al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim.